You have to remember that. I need to remind us of that. You know, when we come before God and we hear him speak to us his living word, you know, we come before him with fear and trembling. But not just fear and trembling, with great joy and gratitude, a time of celebration. It's a, a time where we experience seriousness, sometimes even sadness, but even surprise and gladness. It's a time where God gives us a full experience of himself. And so we're going to experience the range of emotions and thoughts. We're going to hear comforting words, familiar words. We should be expectant as we come into God's holy presence that we meet him, we experience him in his fullness, and we can sing with gratefulness and with great joy. With that, let us come into this time of worship, hear this call, and respond in the bold. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared of all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Join me in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, the God of Almighty, the God, our Savior, the God, our Redeemer, the God, our Lover. We thank you so much for the way that you have worked in history and how we know you have worked, just as you have freed your people from slavery in Egypt. So you have freed us from the bondage to condemnation and to the devil, to a life of full acceptance, all because and through the work of Jesus, your Son. 
We thank you for the freedom that we can now have to live in fellowship with you. And we pray that you would help us to walk through the wilderness experience as we make our way to you, our heavenly home. May we walk in true obedience, not disobedience, in joy, not grumbling, in clarity of conviction, not confusion. And may today's worship help us along the way. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 With that, please stand. Let's sing and celebrate a mighty fortress. Sing a mighty fortress. A mighty fortress is our God of all would never be. Our helper, he amid the blood of mortal is prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his ease. to be hearing from God's word, 1, 1 Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12. We're going to be hearing in two parts rather than the whole chapter, 1 Kings 12, starting at verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. 
Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. And then down to verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn against to their Lord, again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Then this thing became a sin for the people. Uh, went as far, for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among, among the people, all who were, who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed a, fifth, a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah. And he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. This is the word of the Lord. What you have just heard is a civil war that has taken place in Israel, where the kingdom has been torn in two. It's because there were a group of people who did not want to come under God and his word and king. It's a reminder for us how hard it is to come under God's word, and yet only under God's word would we find life. And so it's a reminder for us to think, of back, think back and remember all the ways that we have heard God's word and have not obeyed. We're going to take some time to reflect and to pray this prayer of confession. Have a moment to think quietly or pray, do business with God, and then together as a church we'll pray this confession. Let us pray. We want to be a people who are united under God and his word. And so we pray together. Our Father in heaven. Before we heard his call, but when we heard him, like Lazarus, we arose. But, O oh, Father, the grave clothes bind us still, old habits that we cannot throw off, old customs that are so much a part of our lives that we are helpless to live the new life that Christ calls us to live. Give us strength, O oh, Father, to break the bonds. Give us courage to live a new life in you. Give us faith to believe that with your help we cannot fail. All this we ask in the name of the Savior, who has taught us to come to you. Amen. We'll hear this word of pardon and assurance, that if you confess your sin with a repentant heart and depend upon God's redeeming mercy, your sins are forgiven. So trust in the work of Christ, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. 
And with that, let us sing of our Savior who has captured our hearts and keeps us. He will hold us fast. Please stand together. Sing when I fear. When I fear my faith fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter will be there, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me. is 
Welcome again. Um, I have some news in the life of the church, and then we'll pray and take up our collection. So first of all, well done for, for all of you who have come at 10 o'clock, our new time. Just want to keep reminding and get, getting that into our minds and brains there. So um, also, after uh, service today, we're going to be starting our adult Sunday school. And so we, there is child care provided, um, but we'll be starting around 11.45, 11.50. So you'll, after the service, we'll have some time for fellowship, and then we'll reconvene here for our adult Sunday school. This Friday, we have a women's event. It's in the evening, 7 p.m. at uh, Linda and Janine's this Friday, April 19th, where the ladies will um, learn how to prep for nuclear war. Okay, so they're going to be learning how to can um, vegetables and fruits and all that. So we'll all be ready. Um, uh, next, uh, next week, we'll also have adult Sunday school after the service. But after that, we'll have a short hike at the Bartlett Arboretum. So there will be lunch provided so that we could make our way to the hike. So just be uh, aware of that, plan for that, and maybe even think of... Uh, people that you could um, invite out either to church or even to the hike where we could meet them and people can see who we are as the church. Um, the only other announcement I have is one that Pastor Brandon is about to give about the trivia night. So. Great. Well, good morning. i um, excited about this trivia night and just wanted to mention a couple of things about it. Um, first is just a thank you. Um, if you didn't realize, Grace Stanford being a part of this trivia night is a great gift to Grace Norwalk. Uh, we're still pretty small, and so for us to be able to host an event like this and to get the energy of people together, we'd have a hard time. And so it's actually a really gift to us to be able to do it with you. Along those lines, then, to give you an idea of what we're hoping to do. You know, in the early church, we get this idea both from Jesus, who says that the world will know Christians by their love, and really by their love for each other. And then we read about it in the early church where often the people around the Christian community saw how the Christians cared for each other and cared for their neighbors. That almost always happened in the community where the Christians were visible and present. And so this event is along those lines. For a lot of people coming here on a Sunday morning to this building is a huge step. And so for them actually coming to a third space, more in their space in terms of where their normal life is, that's a great opportunity for them to get um, side by side with Christians and see who we are, how we relate to each other, and how we have fun together. And so here's my pitch for trivia night. Number one, we're going to have a great time. And so when we're together in this type of event, we have a great time. And so we'd love for you to be there and have fun with us. Uh, the space is great, Space Cat Brewery up in Norwalk. Uh, it's a beautiful space. We'll have a, a beautiful night together. Um, number two, this is an easy way to make an invitation. And so because it's a trivia night, a charity of trivia night, you can make the pitch that you're hosting a team and you'd love for them to come and join your team. And so in our case, we're inviting our neighbors who are on either side of us, some friends from the kids' school, and some friends from soccer. Those are the type of people you could be thinking about. And really be thinking about the people you want to get to know better. Those who you might have short conversations with, 
um, at work or at the sideline of a game, but somebody who you'd really like to spend some more low-key hangout time with. That's the goal of this, is that you'd be able to invite people easily um, to a third space where in the future, if you had the chance to talk to them about faith or talk to them about church, you already have a pathway to where they've already met some of your church friends, they've already seen your church in um, action in the sense of they were fun people who we could hang around. And so that's what we're hoping to do. And so what we need is for you to be with us. And so it'd be really helpful if you can let me know. And so you can use the QR code to sign up, or you can just let me know your plans. I can help you brainstorm um, how you'd like to be involved, whether you just want to come by yourself and join another team, or whether you'd like to put a team together. One way to think about it is maybe two families from church join together, and each of you invite another family as friends, and so you could build a team that way. And so we're praying about this. We're really asking that God would, would bring people who would start to get to know what Jesus is like through us. And so be praying about it, thinking about it, and then let me know um, if you have questions or let me know if you can join us. I've, I've got a couple of questions maybe just to start it off. Um, so, uh, Pastor, um, when you have a team... You're going to have a table. How many people are at the table? Eight to ten. Eight to ten. All right. So that's one team um, for, for a table. And then can you invite Christians as well? <laughs> or is it only non-Christians? No, you certainly can. All right. You can invite anybody. All right. Friends, <laughs> Christians and non-Christians alike. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to spend some time in prayer, and, and then we'll take up the collection. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your word is life. By your spirit, you wrote on the tablets of the hearts of people who would bow the knee to Jesus so that they would know your will, they would know you. And so we're eternally grateful that we here, as Grace Church Stanford, believers, we hear you speak to us this word of truth and life. Thank you so much. We thank you that just as you spoke creation into existence, so you bring life through the womb. We want to pray for the, the ladies in our church fellowship who are pregnant. Grant them peace as much as excitement as they feel the baby growing inside of them. Help them to be praying and preparing their hearts and minds to adjust to motherhood and to the opportunity of raising godly offspring that would know Jesus. And just as you grant life, we pray for those of us who work as the way to sustain life. Thank you for our jobs and livelihoods. We pray that we would work with godly purpose, knowing you put us in our positions according to your plans. Help us to know how to be good co-workers, able to live out our faith in deed and action. Give those of us who might be discouraged at work hope and energy to endure through our challenges and bring people to a place of satisfaction and gratitude for their work. We pray that just as you have breathed new life into us through Christ and by the Spirit, you would be working through us so others would also hear the good news of Jesus. There are many opportunities to engage and invite neighbors and friends to our activities as a church. We pray for the friends we're thinking of inviting to the trivia night with Grace Norwalk. And we pray that you would be with Pastor Brandon and all the preparation that's going into the evening. Be especially moving those invited to come out and not just have a fun even, evening, but to get to know other Christians. We thank you for the richness of friendships that are found in the church. May we be a people who are shaped by the word of God where we experience a common bond that is so deep in spirit because your word continues to stir renewal in our hearts. May we sense your rewarding grace at work in our relationships. Help us to experience your presence when we are together and together under your word. And yes, would you grow us all in biblical literacy and in deep faith that knows who you are at your heart, O oh God, that it would even transform us as we believe you and hear from you. 
We pray for the word of God to be spread not only among our neighbors, but around the world. And so we pray for missionaries in the 1040 window, that they'd be able to hand the most precious gift a human can give to another, the Bible, your word, to any one of the five billion Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists in that region of the world. Yes, hear our cries for the many who would actually want to hear from you and would want to read your word of God for themselves but don't have access. Yes, send out missionaries and send out Bibles, we pray. And we want to pray especially for the region of the Middle East and Israel and the attacks that they are facing. What a fraught time it is for that country. We pray for your mercy against this unrelenting presence of evil in, there, in that region. We pray that you would hear our prayers, O oh God, that you would act, that you would restrain evil, that people would know that you are still God despite all the chaos and misery. Yes, we pray for the churches and the Christians on the ground there that you would raise up people, people who could speak your word of hope and truth, people who would be able to care for one another. Yes, it's a small thing in the midst of geopolitical, global-scale war, but we ask, oh God, that you would work. You would work humbly through people, through humble people, oh God, that would trust, would dare to trust your name. Yes, you are the one true living God who has spoken. We thank you that we can hear your voice by faith. And here in our country, read your word in safety and in comfort. And we pray that we would indeed hear from you and meet with you, Lord Jesus. Receive all glory, O God. Receive these prayers and receive even our small expression of offering for the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll take up the collection. Okay, we're going to be hearing from God's Word. We're looking at 1 Kings 17. We're starting a new sermon series on God's ministry to us. I know that just sounds kind of obvious and almost even redundant, but it's really important to know how God ministers to us. And I have sensed that we have an idea of how God ministers to us, like through the prophets, priests, and kings. But actually, I also sense that we're not really sure about these prophets, priests, and kings. And so, and yet, that is how God works, through the ministry of prophet, priest, and king. And so we want to get to know these roles, these offices, and how especially Jesus fills the roles of prophet, priest, and king so that he would minister to us, okay? In fact, we might learn something else, something more about Jesus and even our salvation, um, so for several weeks, we're going to be focused on the office of prophet, and then priest, and then king. And today, we're starting um, to look at the story of Elijah. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe uh, in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And though the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. 
So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is, east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it myself for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to be working through that passage. um, And I'm going to begin the sermon the way that the Lord begins this chapter. You know, this is a new chapter in God's unfolding plan. And he simply introduces Elijah, the prophet, with the most minimal background. And so for me, likewise, that's it. There's your introduction. We're just going to dive right in. But the big idea, as before we get into the word, is simply this, that God will win his people to a life of faith and faithfulness by his word. Okay, that's the big idea that I want us to keep in mind, that God will win his people to a life of faith and faithfulness um, through his word. Got three points for you. The first one is the battle between Yahweh and Baal. Verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Okay, there we have it. Elijah pronounces this word of judgment. But why? Why does Elijah pronounce this word of judgment on God's people Israel? Well, this is all part of the saga, the dark history of Israel. Um, And this would eventually lead to its downfall. Okay, there's going to be a human element, a human story element here. We'll get to that. But it is set in this wider context. It's bigger than Elijah and the widow. It's a cosmic battle between the one true living God and the rival deity called Baal. He was one of the idols that the Middle East region believed in as part of like their spiritual worldview back in the 9th century B.C. Baal, he was the storm god. He was the rider on the clouds, the god who controlled the weather. He was important because if you control the weather, you control life, fertility, prosperity. 
Now, why was there even this battle between Yahweh, the God of Israel, and this local deity, Baal, who was an idol, no, not a god at all? Because there's a shock to this story that Elijah, he pronounces his word of judgment on Ahab. And who was Ahab? He was the king of Israel, and he was worshiping Baal. See, this was the leader of God's people, Yahweh. But this guy is totally confused, right? He's like a vegan in a butcher shop. He's like a man with morning sickness. He is worshiping the wrong God. This is the situation that Israel was in, in this period of history. And it had been going on for a long while now. Let me take you back to 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 25, just so that we get a sense of what the history of Israel was like in that time. 1 Kings 16, verse 25. Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he had made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. Okay? We can, there's Omri, this king, who was Ahab's father. And Omri was in the line of King Jeroboam. Remember Jeroboam? We, we read about him in 1 Kings chapter 12. A little bit of background there. Solomon was king after David, and after Solomon was his son Rehoboam. Rehoboam inherited the throne, but Jeroboam led a revolt against Rehoboam and set up a rival kingdom with the northern tribes of Israel. If you know your Bibles and the big picture, the storyline, there is a split in the nation's history. Okay? This was a devastating period of spiritual rebellion that would ultimately lead to exile and even extinction. Jeroboam, the rival king, he set up an alternate Yahweh, the Lord. He basically established an alternate religion based on the geography, moving um, the capital city of worship from Jerusalem, where the temple was, to Samaria. And this would be the origin of the Samaritans, who we meet later in the New Testament, the ones, the, the people that the Jews hated. Okay? So Jeroboam led Israel into national idolatry and apostasy. And actually, all the successive kings in the northern tribes of Israel would continue that tradi tradition. And that brings us to Omri's son, Ahab. 1 Kings 16 again, verse 29. L listen to this background. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of, of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Okay? King Ahab, king of God's people in Israel, did more evil than all the kings before him, worshiping Baal, establishing Baal um, uh, temples, marrying Jezebel. There's a series um, on TV called The Man in the High Castle. It's a dystopian movie, uh, and it's depicting an alternate history of America where America lost World War II. And so the continental U.S. was occupied by the Russians and the Germans. It's crazy. We can't imagine it. And yet that was the extent of the situation in Israel. It's actually worse than what Israel had, had to go through because the, in Israel, the kings let all these idols and foreign nations in through the front door. Was God in trouble? What about his purposes and his promises? 
Well, the point finally came when Yahweh had to set things straight. He had to make his judgment clear because his plan of redemption was not going to be jeopardized by foolish kings. Yahweh would show Ahab the evil that he was committing in worshiping Baal and the consequences of it. See, if Baal was the storm god who controlled the weather, well, then Yahweh would say to Ahab and to Baal, sorry, I'm stronger than you, and here's how I'm going to show it. No water, no rain, not even dew. Let's see if you can do anything about it, Baal. In today's terms, what was happening here was a showdown. It's like a big fight about to happen, right? I think there was a big fight last night on TV. I heard about this. I don't know what it was all about. But nowadays, when there's a big fight, what, what happens is there's a lot of promotion, and so there's a weigh-in, right? There's a day that everyone come, the, the, the fighters come together before the main event. They come in for the weigh-in, and sometimes you even get a little preview of the fight because they like... The boxers or the fighters, they square up and then one pushes another and then they get into a scuffle, right? That's the battle between Yahweh and Baal. This is, is going to be a real big showdown. And now, all this can sound dramatic, whereas many of us, we're probably here, we're here, and, and some of us as Christians here, we're, we're like, oh, I, I'm focused on life on the ground, like something practical, I'm just trying to survive and get by. Maybe it's a terrible work situation, marriage problems, health issues, caring for aging parents. I mean, the list goes on. There's a whole host of challenges that we could be facing, and we're just thinking, none of this cosmic talk really helps, makes a difference in my life. And I want to remind us that even down to the most practical details of life, we are caught up in this context of a spiritual battle. Spiritual realities. We need to know that God can help us. Can he help pay the bills? Can he help bring healing? I need immediate help, urgent help right now. But we need to know who God is, who God is and why he can help us, not just that we insist that he helps us. Suffering is real, but it is not pointless. God is doing something in our lives for our good. And that means we need to know the bigger story. Where our lives are caught up in God's redemptive work, in a, in a work that's going to bring us life and life even beyond the grave. See, knowing about this battle matters because our faith, it's not built on a house of cards, no. But here, King Ahab is trying to build this house of cards. That's the battle between Yahweh the Lord and um, Baal. Our second point is the presence of the word and the prophet. Israel needed someone to lead them to teach the people about God faithfully and in truth, to turn the people back to God because without it, they were lost under this wicked king who was leading them astray. And so we come to Elijah's ministry. As prophet. You know, America has three branches of government, checks and balances uh, of powers that rules a nation, right? You have the legislative, the executive, and the ju judicial. Well, in a similar way, God had organized his nation of people, Israel, with offices, prophets, priests, and kings. Kings were the figurehead leaders. Priests op operated temple worship. What was the point of the prophets then? When the priests and the kings failed to rule properly, God would raise up prophets to call kings and priests back to repentance, reminding them of God's covenant promises to call out sin, pronounce judgment when necessary, like now, and to teach and lead the people. And so here with Elijah, we're seeing the official introduction to the office of the prophet, where the prophet would speak Yahweh's words as if Yahweh the Lord were present himself. He had the authority to say, thus saith the Lord. And where God's word was, there Yahweh was. Look at verse 2, back in 1 Kings 17. 
And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. See, the Lord, by his word, through Elijah, would pronounce the judgment of drought on Israel. But the scarier judgment that we're seeing here was the removal of the word of the Lord. Ahab rejected God's word time and time again, and so Yahweh would remove access to the word that was the source of life. Elijah was to hide himself. The presence of God and the truth of his word would not be available to the king or to the nation any longer. And the drought that was going to take place, that was a sign of the state of the relationship with the Lord. Verse 4, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan, and the ravens brought in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. See, we're seeing the, the word of the Lord, his judgment, bringing drought. Elijah was led to water. He was even led to food through these ravens. This is a picture of Yahweh providing for Elijah with the resources to live. Where the word is, there is life. Carrying on, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon, and dwell there, because I have commanded a widow there to feed you. The drought was so severe that even the brook Terek dried up, and so the Lord sends Elijah to find water. Where? To this area, to his land of Zarephath. And this move to go to Zarephath, the land of Sidon, had more significance than just Elijah's survival. The word through Elijah, was to go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon. Why there? Why are we told that he has to go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon? If you remember back in chapter 16, where I read verse 31, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians and went and served Baal and worshipped him. The Lord was telling Elijah to go to Sidon, to leave Israel as a sign of clear judgment, but also go to this pagan land, to the center of Baal worship. See, God was sending Elijah to enemy territory, to the Death Star, if you know your Star Wars, right? He was going there, because he was about to give a smackdown. This is the way in, the main event. It would come in the next chapter next week. But God is sending Elijah into the territory of Baal, where they will have that confrontation. And that's our second point, the word of the prophet. Um, and, and the presence of the word and the prophet. Final point, the grace of God and the widow. Yahweh's judgment on Israel would lead... Um, to this moment of grace and life for this Sidonian widow and her young son. See, through judgment, there would be grace. It's a wacky scene, and we'll try to work out what the point of all of this would be. Verse 10, So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. This is kind of a bold request that Elijah makes, Right? They're in a drought-like condition, and he asks someone else for some water, as if they have water to share. Um, and yet, she's about to comply, but then what does Elijah say? Verse 11, and as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. <laughs> I mean, this is almost comical. You have to see how like, ridiculous this is. It's like, Elijah might as well have asked the woman, bring me a steak and lobster dinner, right? Don't overcook the meat. And while you're at it, bring some sparkling water. I don't need any tap water. And don't be stingy on the ice either. That's what Elijah is basically saying to this widow. Chop, chop, come on now, right? Verse 12. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Now I'm gathering up a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. 
<laughs> Elijah is imposing on this woman who wants to have her final meal. <laughs> he insists. But with that, he follows up with an offer that is hard to believe, one that would involve a great deal of trust from this widow. Verse 13, And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Here is the authoritative word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Yahweh's word, his will, his reputation is on the line. He has to provide for this poor widow, supplying her needs. And he would, because, he, because through her, the prophet's <laughs> needs, the word of the Lord would survive and remain. Verse 16 goes, The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. You notice this emphasis on the word of the Lord, how it really makes a difference in bringing life to those who would receive it. Every day, the widow, she would reach into the flour jar, measure out a portion, knead it, add some water, pour on some oil on the pan, bake it, and cook up some bread. And she would have been thinking, yeah, Yahweh might be the real deal. I don't mind sharing with Elijah. In fact, I feel pretty good about this. Good about herself. But it wasn't until disaster struck, struck that she learned about who Yahweh really was in all of his fullness. Through this pagan widow, Israel would have to learn about who God, Yahweh, the Lord was in all of his fullness. This is the point of the minor character, this widow, who was helped by God's grace in the face of judgment. Verse 17. After this, the son of the wo woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no le breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring to my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. She's speaking words of truth. Her, her son's death was even her death because she was a widow. He was her lifeline, her last hope of survival with no husband. If the son died, she would eventually die too. And so feeling that at the core, her response was bitter. You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. She feels like she's being punished by God because of her sins. And as a result, her death is going to follow. Elijah, he too felt the cruelty of this situation. And so he would plead intensely with God. And he would revive the son. See, the widow would have to go through all this tragedy to learn who Yahweh really was. He could give life by controlling the weather, by multiplying resources, and even by reviving the dead. And so what did this woman do? She confessed him. Verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the, the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Isn't that an interesting response? It's not, now I know I can have my son back. Now, it's not even, now I know that God lives. It's now I know that you are a man of God. The word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She would come to know who Yahweh was through the mediator, this officer, this prophet, Elijah. There's a story let me uh, wrap things up in terms of bringing things together, and then we'll apply it. We've seen this major theme of the word of God working. It worked at this spiritual and cosmic level. It was declared by God's man, Elijah, who would fill the office of prophet. 
He would speak the word of God, which was backed up by signs and wonders to give life. And that word would have planted a seed of faith in this widow, which would lead to real life. With that, our takeaway for us would be the word of God, it produces a life-giving faith and a life-giving faithfulness. Life-giving faith. You know, here's the truth. Hearing the word of God, meeting the one true living God, it can be a harrowing experience. Like, really scary. It's, it's like childbirth, which is often a painful, bloody, messy experience, so I'm told, right? It's a lot of dangers involved, a lot of risks. It's like hearing the word of God could be like that. Let me put it another way for us. It can be an imposition to hear the word of the Lord. It can be an imposition to hear the word of the Lord in your life, and you believe it. See, the widow, she experienced this imposition. It started with Elijah's request, right? The pains of faith. And even before it was her sharing her last meal, sacrificing what would be this final source of life for her, it was her being forced out of her own little world to have to acknowledge Yahweh through this man and then give in to this prophet's demands in that end-of-life moment. It's a harrowing experience, hearing the word of the Lord. Like her, I think all we've known is ourselves, and we're forced to make room in our lives for this supreme God who made us. It, it sounds kind of ridiculous for me to have to put it that way. Like, is it really that hard to acknowledge the God who has made you and has ownership over you? Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Letting him in is scary. You might even lose a part of yourself. There might be grief in the loss of your old life. But one is able to go through it because there is so much more to gain with God. Just think of the alternative, life without God. If you've grown up in a Christian home or have been around Christians most of your life, you very well have lost touch with the trauma of submitting yourself to the Lord. Not fully, hopefully. But I hope that this perspective where God imposes himself on you, that helps us in our interactions with the world, with non-Christians, and even those who might call themselves Christians but are totally misguided or struggling or compromised. There is an internal clash of wills that is going on. Maybe you're here right now and you are feeling that internal clash of wills. It is a violent thing that goes on in the soul. As you hear from this word of the Lord, if you're going through that, that's a good sign. But it's also a sign that needs to lead to the miracle of life. Rebirth, not stillbirth. The word by God's grace produces a life-giving faith. Amongst us, there are many spiritual midwives that could help people along the way. More of that in a moment. But for us who've experienced the, the miracle of being born again, we might still feel the trauma in some ways from various tests that we're faced with in life. It's challenging, but we're called to a life of faithfulness. And that's the next takeaway, life-giving faithfulness. You know, the widow, she experienced the power of judgment up close and personal in, in order to experience the fullness of Yahweh's grace, where she could now fully trust him, confess him. See, the reviving of her son, that was a powerful sign, wasn't it? I mean, it would have brought so much relief. There's that motherly, emotional bond where she now has her son back, more time on earth with him. 
Not only that, she was given hope, not just a joy, that he would be able to live and care for her in her old age. But the point that the Lord has for us, really, is that it is the word that gives life to this pagan Gentile woman who had no business being with Yahweh. But the word of the Lord found her and brought her into the covenant people of God. And yet she had to go through that whole experience of being exposed to the sign of judgment, the death of her son, before she could experience the fullness of grace. And for us, this might be the hardest thing to learn from the woman's bitter response, if you remember. And that is, we all know that we're going to die. But we want to go on our own terms, not God's terms. The woman, she had to learn the hard way with the touch of death, not in herself, but in her son, the sign of judgment. She didn't want her son to die. She probably would have been able to say, take me instead. But no, it's not on our terms, but it's on God's terms. And yet, through all of that, she would see and experience the grace of God, the life-giving word. In this way, I think all of us can identify with the widow. Something terrible happens, and you know you're headed for glory, but why do we have to face such terror? We can't handle it. Where is your grace, God? Or worse, you think something happens, and it's hard not to think this. God is angry with me. I've done something. I'm accountable, and I've fallen short. I can't make things right. It's like this widow. I obeyed. I sacrificed my last meal for you. <laughs> I should be good. And yet, another calamity. What did I do to deserve this? Where is your grace? It's a fair and natural question to ask, but I think we need to train ourselves to ask the question the right way, and it would be this. You know, you're going to make a bitter response the way that this woman did towards God. Sometimes you can't help it. But I think we need to be honest and ask the question this way. Where is the grace, O oh God, that I don't deserve? Isn't that what grace is? Where is the grace, O oh God, that I don't deserve? And from that, would God send a prophet, somebody who could speak a word and intercede for the way that Elijah did for this widow, the kind that would find you even make a demand on you, but speak truth to you in a way that would revive you and give you life again. Where is the grace I don't deserve? It's a hard question to ask. And I need someone to help me with that question and would not leave me hanging with that question either. Do you know of a prophet like that? Hebrews 1 one says this, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our father, fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus would be that prophet, the very life-giving word himself. And he would take the judgment that we all were accountable for and from it be able to show us his grace. You know what? He would be the faithful one before any of us ever could be. All of us would fall short, but he, him alone, would be the faithful one. And it's by Jesus' faithfulness that we all can live. And it's by Jesus' faithfulness that we do live, where we draw life breath from him and his word. He's wanting us to see that there's a spiritual battle going on, but that he has won it. He is victorious, despite all the struggles that we face. You might feel like you're in a spiritual drought. Whether it's tragedy or even a good challenge that you have before you for the sake of God and kingdom to please him. 
But would you dare to believe that you find living waters from Jesus himself? Life-giving waters. It's by grace that he got us to believe in the first place and grace by grace that he will keep us believing. This is how God ministers to us. God would have us hear the words of Jesus, his gentle words of comfort and invitation. I wonder if we need to hear from Christ now. Might you need a moment to confess Christ? Listen for his voice. And that goes for some of us who might be here who have never really confessed in Christ in this scary way where he imposes himself on you in order to give you new life. Do you need to confess Christ for the first time? Now is not the time to hold our breaths, but to draw on the breath of God. The word of Jesus. Let's pray. May we all have a moment to confess Christ to ourselves. Father, thank you so much for your life-giving word. (coughs) Thank you that that word takes full shape and form in the person of Jesus, who's the radiance, the glory of God, the exact imprint of the Father's nature, the one who upholds the universe by the power of his word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that we could hear your word, we could believe it, and that it could sustain us. Yes, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord Jesus, that you bearing our punishment, our judgment, you show us much grace. Thank you for the daily grace that sustains us, that reminds us that we are secure and that we are yours, O God. Help us live out of that strength and grace and power. Help us to be faithful in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Life-giving waters, life-giving bread. That is what we have in the Lord Jesus, and that is what we're going to experience and partake in now with the Lord's Supper. So hear this invitation. Hear the words of our Savior. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls together. (coughs) We come not because we ought, but because we may. Not because we are righteous, but because we are repentant. Not because we are strong, but because we are weak. And not not because because we are whole, but because we are are broken. And with that, brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. And awaiting his coming in glory, let us pray with confidence (coughs) as our Savior has taught us. And we're going to read, you're going to follow me, read this slowly so that you could pray it slowly to yourselves together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've prayed that prayer, not because you memorized it as a kid, but because you believe it with conviction that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he's taken away God's judgment, he's lifted you to new life, then this meal is for you. (coughs) If that is not you, then simply remain in your seats. I do hope that maybe for some of us, 
This might be you for the first time, and if that is the case, then you're most welcome to heartily partake. But those of us who do come up hear this sober word that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the, Lord, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of our Lord. So let a person examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, he gave thanks to the Father, and then he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant. It's sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death and that he will indeed come again. You have two trays, you're going to come up and take from only one. Either wine, which is the first tray you'll encounter, or juice, the second tray. So take it back to your seats, prepare, we'll partake of the meal together. Please come up. body of Christ, the bread of life. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Pray this prayer of thanksgiving together. <coughs> Gracious God, we thank you for the love that brings us food from heaven. 
gives us the life of your dear Son, and assures us that we belong to the company of all his faithful people in heaven and on earth. Grant that strengthened by this fellowship, by the power of his Holy Spirit, we may continue his work in the world until we come to the glory of your eternal kingdom through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing and celebrate our salvation, our new life we have in him. O church, arise. Let's stand. Church arise, oh church arise, put your armor on, give the call of Christ our captain, for now the weak can say that they are strong, in the strength that God has given, we shield the faith and bow to truth, we stand against the devil's lies, an army bold. Battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Sing our call to war. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captive. And with the sword that makes the wounded old, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which He died, an inheritance of nations. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Arise. cross. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes not crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges from his grave this victory march Continue still the day, every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, strengthen every stride, be a grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, Telling triumphs of His grace We hear their calls and hunger for the day When with Christ we stand in glory Arise, shine, for your light has come Arise
receive God's benediction. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Everyone have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you back here in about 15, 20 minutes for Adult Bible Study, Sunday School. Thank mm-hmm. you.